Now I'll just got to click got it here. So I will start my screen sharing and uh, go to choose the right screen. There's always a ch chance on these meetings that one press the wrong buttons, even if one do nothing more than this all day long. So I start with this uh, picture of uh, yeah, one of these things one found find on Facebook every now and then. This was from last week, I think. It's about everything that is green. We have green skyscrapers, green power, green aircraft, green trash burners and green packaging, green cars and everything. So it's no problem with everything. Everything is green. I don't think that anyone tries to sell anything else than green stuff today. Still, there seems to be some issues every here and there, like uh, islands of plastic in the ocean and so. And the greenhouse gas emissions keep, keep, yeah, being concentrated in the atmosphere and so. So we have some challenges anyway, even if everything is perfectly green. So then what I am about to talk about here is the need for standardization within the area of circular economy. I cannot address everything there. There's so many things we need to address to standardize. And um, also the, there is ongoing standards. So I will pre present quite a bit of what we are going in the on ongoing standardizations, but also address some threads to where we need more standardization, which we're not exactly doing right now. And as, since I'm already presented, I can just mention that I am also working at RICE Research Institutes of Sweden uh, as a senior re researcher in the, um, in the unit of certification development, which we do, the, we do super interesting stuff because we, we work with research and, and researchers. Uh, and when their results, are close to the market. Uh, they, are, they can be uh, given as a consultant knowledge, so to say, as researchers working projects, but we can also take it to a full verifiable, certifiable type of knowledge that really runs in the industry at an, any, any scale and is as trustworthy knowledge, tools and uh, data, things like that. So it's a really interesting area where, where everything, all the knowledge can be made, put into the industrial society. And I must say that that is our oh, industrial society, whatever we want to call our society, to really the large scale uh, um, and, and trustworthy information that we need, not only uh, ideas or knowledge. So it's a fantastic uh, area to work in, working in sustainable sustainability and traceability. So that is my fields because we understand that there's a close relationship between sustainability and be able to trace stuff like the green packaging here. It would be nice if someone found them and knew who put them there. It would be good if they can go pick it up after them. So um, the need for standardization, I will come into what is meant with circular economy, common terms and definitions. We are working with standardization now, so we are developing common terms and definitions. And when I show you documents, or not, so I don't, will not show you so much because I really try to weed that out, but you should know that what I'm saying about the standardization that is ongoing, it is really, a standardization is a consensus process and you're not finished until you're finished, which means that, that whenever I say something that is going, that, that seems to be from the ISO world as a ready-made standard, it's not that. It's, it's finished when it's finished. When everybody have agreed, made a formal vote on that, now we really agree on everything, then, then um, it's a standard. Uh, but, but I will not show you so much of what is going on. I really try to avoid that, to, to, to avoid causing any confusion because I understood we were quite many people in, in this group. And, and if non-standardized terms have misunderstood the standardized terms, it will only cause confusion. So common terms and definitions um, about circular economy, some common principles, I will not list the principles, I'll anyway show what they are in general. And, and when also, when I think about circular economy, it, it is also independent of system level. It's not so that a product is circular or, um, uh, or an organization is circular. Circular economy means that it's something actually being taken care of in a, in a circular way. I think, I think that all of you have seen 
uh, we never know if anyone have seen, but I'm sorry. But I show you here, it's Ellen MacArthur's uh, foundation uh, of, of uh, the, the view of what the circular economy is. Uh, and on the left side, it's basically the biological world. It, it's something being taken from the bio, biosphere, consumed, and most of it is going back somewhere. There are lots of chemical uh, uh, symbols here, and so so. I, there are, of course, more than just eating and going to the, to the toilet again. It's more other type, other types also, of course, going on there. But then, the, what is going on in, in, the, in the biological world is, in general, nice. In, in a way, it's, it, you, you, you take what the sun delivers and the soil, the quality of the soil, you eat it and you give it back again to the nature if you take it from, a, from that perspective. But when you come into the more industrialized world, we, we take out what is not renewable. We can, uh, it's, it's, it's in Earth's cr crust. We um, refine it and we, we can throw it away again into a waste pile where everything is lost, the value is lost. But we want to recycle, we want to um, refurbish, and we want to reuse this, and even maintain stuff so that they are not just yeah, consumed and thrown away. So this is the, we want to see, look at this on the, both on the specific uh, um, product level, organizational, activity level, decision level, but also on the highest societal level. So that is what, I'm, what is meant with independent of system level. So also something about how to make a circular economy. I mean, you can, you cannot, yeah, you, if, you can make it at home. I was just about to say that you cannot make it at home, but of course anyone can pull their, pull their uh, straw to the stack, so to say. But so, um, but what, what should you do? What, what, what to do? Some, some ideas on that. How to measure circularity? Uh, why do one want to measure circularity? Because we want to know whether I am better than you or you are better than me and, and if they are better than us. We want to know things like that. And if that is better than what I'm doing today, we want to know if we take we go in the right direction. So that is why we want to measure circularity. So how circular is a circularity action? I will come back to that term, but the circularity action is something that you do that could be circular. You buy something that you think is more circular than something else, and that would be a circular action or your, your product, product designer and you, you, you design a product differently because you think it's more circular. It could be more recyclable. It could be more uh, long lived, for example, then you take a circularity action. And what is a product lifetime? Uh, of course, everybody thinks that the product lifetime is, the, is between two, two mo models of mobile phones, or it could be uh, your genes, which you try to make stay alive for a very long time because they suit you better and better. It could be, I mean, there's so many different lifetimes to, to think about. And uh, if we want to prolong lifetime, what does that mean? Uh, and what is a resource value? It's, uh, I, I, Unfortunately, I cannot give you the answer this time. I, that was a spoiler, of course, but still, I cannot give you the answer. I just want us to have that answer eventually. Otherwise, it's very hard to introduce incentives to keep resource value, because in the beginning, resources are for free, and then we start putting price tags on them, basically. How to link circular value chains and value networks? Because we, we, we think value, there is something called value chain. There is, for example, in the picture here, you can see there is steps. And so that each of them are linked together. So how do we link them together uh, rather than just see things in the shop? And for that, we want to look a little bit into information exchange standards. So this is the content. Why? care about this as if you happen to be very much interested in economy uh, the circular economy the, it has its um, basis we we have on the, on the side here it's called cost yeah that's a negative value and benefit is on the positive value and what i will use that for is to show you invested value and uh, of course then the negative of invested is lost value then so here it starts with the mining is extraction. You take something from a mine and in the beginning it costs you things because you had to get that mine. And uh, then you start producing material from that. It could be steel, it could be 
cobalt for your batteries or anything like that. It's, it's something you, you first take it out, it costs a lot, and then you start making a material production. That's your investment to, to changing it from an ore into a metal, for example. And then you start making a component. And then you, the component could fit the telephone, it could fit the car, it could fit the house, but then it's an actual thingy, some, something that you could really care about. You don't have to be a factory to like it. You can actually be a consumer already at the component level. But then it really happens things, end product production. That is when it becomes a shiny thing, car, earphones, jeans. And that's where you are ready to pay a lot. If you had that same lump of material down here, you wouldn't be so interested as a consumer. But up here, you, you care. And also the industry care about that because if they want to buy, if they want to buy the machinery or, or equipment of any kind, of course, they are ready to pay the machinery rather than, than do the things themselves. So up here is high value. And then you buy it, and then it immediately stop, starts losing value, not only because it's, um, it's yeah, secondhand, it's also because it's war and it becomes more and more obsolete because of modernization and, and, the, and the technology around it, etc. And at some point, it's basically useless. It starts, it's, it's yeah, scrap. And uh, yeah, it's waste. And you start also looking at the wonderful in, industry of recycling. But you, this is investment. This is what what uh, this is where all the industrial labor is put in. It's money. It's energy. It's CO two emissions. It's waste production. It's everything. It's all the transports going between factories and so everything is done to put get up to the peak up here when it's when the product is most valuable, and then the down, downgrade starts. Eventually, it's yeah. Well, how can it? come down here, it, really useless. Some of it is your brake pads, you break over here and there, everything, the material from the brake pads is just dust in, the, in your lungs. And, and uh, high, higher up here, it's a uh, yeah, recyclable thing. You have to sort it and you, it will be a bit degraded. Anyway, that is how it works again. So we start doing it all over. You of course have to fill up with more uh, virgin material every time. And it goes like that. So um, I call it the value roller coaster of the linear economy. Super linear, it's not, of course. Super linear would be to just do this once and go back to the mine again, but you actually do recycling. Um, it, it, from an economist's point of view, one should say, are we really doing this? Are we actually re-spending money, losing it, spending money and losing it? If, imagine if we could spend it and have it, and we could use the new money for something different or, or new energy for something different rather than just reuse it over and over again. That is a questionable thing to do really for a rational society, which I think economists like to see ourselves, at least used to be well, until they understood the importance of decision-making. So um, there is, this report I think is very, interesting it's uh, uh, material economics did in 2020 it's a, a real uh, eye opener uh, they, they investigated aluminum plastics and steel just to see how does it work uh, over a life cycle one of these uh, uh, loops here or what you, uh, the hills of the roller coaster aluminum for example it they, it's purchased 18 billion uh, dollars of um, no, yeah, it, 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 18 billion euros of aluminum to begin with, the, the, the highly valued aluminum alloy, whatever sort it is. And um, during its life, it's recycled pretty well. You save 13, you get back 13 billion uh, uh, euros, which means you only lost eight, uh, five, sorry, my calculations. Here it's at six, it's about uh, uh, how you round them off. And eventually when you try to sell it, to the regional price, price you cannot sell it to, to the regional price because it's actually a bit contaminated, so it's not as useful as it used to be. So now it's uh, worth nine billion euros. So what you had in the beginning has eventually ha halved its value in in aluminum. But if you go to plastics, it's a bit more bad. Uh, so you started off with 62 billion euros of plastics, which is quite a high number. I could, man, aluminum is, of course, fantastic material, but could see how much plastics we are actually spending uh, money on. So uh, buying it for 62 billions, uh, and uh, when you get it back again, the volume, you, you lost most of it somehow. So you only have 13 billion of recycled plastics left. 
but 13 billions, no one pays that. It, you would like that because it used to cost that, but now you only get 7 billions in the end. So you have lost huge amounts, some 62, 55 billion euros of plastic for one recycle loop, but that's quite a lot of bad economy. And the same, oh, steel is pretty, pretty, it's heavy, one, one notices it, it's large constructions. So you buy 67 billion euros, we buy, or Europe buy, 67 billion uh, euros of steel. And after one round, one gets back at least 55 billion euros of steel and haven't lost more than half, yeah, a little bit more than half uh, billion euros. In, in every round. And, uh, and I think this is interesting because here we show that, here we notice that recycling, which is a wonderful system, is still a very bad economy and it should be something about it. And this is basically my first slide, so I haven't come so far yet. But I think it's so important to, to see that this is why we are into re, uh, circular economy. It's, it's to, to show that this is economy, circular is economy. We don't have we, linear economy is not economy or, or whatever we lose is not economy. It's waste, which is uh, wasting uh, values. And here's another of the concepts I'm, I'm going into. This. As I said, I will not use the, the what we have in the standard models. We are really working on the similar kinds of models, but I use something that is not in there because they will anyway uh, uh, change as we um, discuss and learn from each other. A typical circular resource flow, someone takes something from the, from the earth crust to material. As I said before, when we looked at the investment phase, uh, we produce the material that can be used to manufacture components and, and products. And we end up with uh, some consumption. The consumption could be consumers, so it could be production facilities. And uh, in there, it can be reused in a way, um, the kids, yeah, the next generation kids get the previous generation kids clothes and so. And uh, after that, there are a number of loops. One is going to waste. And let's see, come on, uh, going to waste and you can incinerate it to get any recovery. See, I, I rationalized everything. I don't have waste after waste, so to say, and no landfill is here. It's nice if we could skip landfill in some way. Um, it's also, uh, some of it is going to recycle sorting and some of it is actually going to secondhand markets. One can have closed local markets, one can open local yeah, secondhand markets at some higher regional level, but there are also global secondhand markets for, for all sorts of things, especially textile uh, clothes and so on, but also lots of material and uh, uh, components. Uh, but the more general thing is that the recycle sorting and then one take it back to material production. And one would like to see a little bit more on maybe going back over to manufacturing. So it's not only recycle on or it's re, re, um, birthed into re-X material or component. The component level where you actually take things back to remanufacture is not that common. It is getting more and more common. Uh, so this is the, what one can think of as a typical uh, circular uh, resource flow. And I will use it over and over. And that's why I go through it. It's, more, it's not so much that you, I expect you to learn a lot, but I will use the same model over and over in my, in my examples. So what is meant with circular economy? And um, as I said, we are working with this in the standardization in ISO. TCT Technical Committee 323, they have, they have numbers. So this one happened to be that. But the whole idea is that inside there, we, we deal with a new area of circular economy. And when writing standards, one, one is, of course, it's only documents in the end, but they're actually very, have a very practical perspective because quite a lot of people, quite a lot of interest is put into the work. So the whole idea is to, and this concerns ISO is to set, yeah, now in this case, circular economy into globally coordinated practice. So, so when, when the text is written, everybody think about how is this going to work in practice? It, is it in, in my industry, in my, uh, as a consumer, as an NGO, as an expert who's going to verify information, all these kinds of practical approaches are put into the mix. 
And it's not ISO who develops standards, which uh, if you're not so familiar with it, it's ISO is just the platform. And they, they have regulations, they have uh, secretaries, they have um, directors, and everybody's, the whole aim is to help experts agree and feel a stress because in three years they have to be finished. We got a little bit more time because of the of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, but that is uh, it's so three and a half maybe years. So that is what we what everybody does. They come there with the pre presumptions that everybody should listen to them, and everybody have that presumption. So everybody have to learn to listen to each other, and then we develop the standards into something practically. So we establish key definitions of. Circular economy, very much on that is based in, in this time in this one, 59004, a number again, is will deal with terminology, principles, and framework for implementation. And uh, something about how to guide circular act improvement, how to how how does should people do in, in reality? They are going, and yeah, it then it's come to guidelines on business models and value chains, and uh, how to guide circular performance and it's basically circular performance calculation so or, or an assessment so measuring and assessing uh, circularity calculation is of course not the first step getting the data right uh, is the first step and then eventually one measure and assess and then how to close the loop um, that is very much about data sharing products circularity data sheet how do we how do we know that something that one organization have put into a, a product is knowledge the next part throughout the value chain is actually getting that in the hand. That is the product data, uh, circularity data sheet is going on as a work. So this is what happens. I didn't mention these two analysis of case studies because we, we, we don't have a standard yet. So it's, it's, a, it's hard to really analyze the existing case studies. And the review of business models is quite much the same. They are ongoing work and people learn from the practice they have but at the same time the world is really changing in the in the other ones 5904 10 20 and 40 that is where where the world is really agreed upon what we are looking at so this is the ongoing standardization and the, the most important part of this standardization um, yet is the, uh, the, the 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 meaning of circular economy it is an economic system yeah system is something that is being contained that uses a systemic approach to maintain a circular flow of resources by regenerating, retaining, or adding to their value. So um, there is this resource flow in here. And I added also other things because we only had the key resources. They cannot be maintained without a lot of energy input. And there are other type of resources that make it possible to run this system. So um, that is the, uh, uh, the economic system and uh, with this uh, maintenance and it also should contribute to sustainable development where to put that arrow it's up here it could have been put inside also because it's not to overrun people it's actually to enable people but if you look at that from a global scale it's to contribute to sustainable development and that is actually interesting because that was not evident when we started the standardization that we should really have that. But the consensus is really heavy that we, we cannot just create the circular economy and then see how it goes. There, there should, it, it really a requirement set there to, to contribute to the sustainable development. And again, the, the pictures I have here are not the ones that we are developing in the standardization group. We'll see what happens with, when they, uh, well, with them a little bit later, the pictures there. So um, to go through now um, a little bit more in detail in there, just, um, that, uh, but what does it mean, a systemic approach to maintain a circular flow of resources? It's just bus, it's the words. But it is it's to start with acknowledging that one have resource use, that one start recording, making data about the resource use one have. It's not only invoices, it's actually numbers and, and values of resources. And therefore one had to establish metrics, how much is circular, uh, how much is recycled, how much is uh, primary uh, material, etc. So these kinds of metrics to really start distinguish between, between the facts that is needed to to, to think circular, establish statistics, and of course, also in the end, establish circularity targets. That is when you, you cannot do that unless you first acknowledge and start recording and stuff like that. Um, 
and then about regenerating uh, the uh, resources value. Um, you're of course about quite a lot about natural resources, acknowledging the natural resources exist, acknowledging biodiversity that we actually, if we are taking out uh, natural resources uh, by the uh, yeah, renewable resources, we cannot just get. Yeah, um, Take it out and then forget about it. So one actually should uh, ensure that there are that this is done in a renewable way, a uh, sustainable way, and ensuring that resource values are regenerated through new into renewable resources. That we, whenever we re recycle, we should not recycle on the expense of uh, uh, non-renewable uh, resources. Retaining, slowing, uh, as I say, retaining the value of resources, slowing resource throughput, not going so quickly from uh, from a uh, high grade to to, to waste uh, making use of it a longer time slowing resource value loss see how i stressed that there is is one thing about resources themselves and one about their value loss could uh, could happen if you down cycle too quickly in in a different recycling system maintaining and servicing upgrading uh, particularly now in the world of electronics and uh, software one would like to upgrade stuff usb ports and so uh, refurbishing uh, means fixing it so it looks good new or good enough or re and remanufacturing not taking them first to the recycling unit and scrapping them and then melting them and uh, whatever is done in reality today in practice and adding to value, the two most important things, increased utilization rate, rather than having cars parked everywhere, one could have many people sharing the same car, for example, and there's many things we have just waiting to be used till the next time. Right resource for right value is quite a lot about not using too high grade resources in places where you can actually have a lower grade resource. And as I said, while contributing to sustainable development, so uh, not increased resource loss, not increased environmental impact while you're recycling or whatever you do, not harm social or physical health because of circular actions. Because sometimes when people make good, they think making bad is okay with them when you do that, but here is you're trapped into making good twice. So um, apply principles and tools such as ISO 26000, it's already there, do not have to rewrite that. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, everybody thinks that there are seven, but there's 169 or something like that, or is it 68? See, quite a many if you, if you open them up. So, and it's also used in the tools we already have, life cycle assessment, including carbon footprint, water footprint, social life cycle assessment that is upcoming, and other, other of these tools. So this is, see, this is the first definition in, uh, in the first standard. And it took me, I don't know how long to describe it, but I wanted to give it life because it's really important because what is circular economy? And we start, when we start getting at and understanding that this is circular economy, it can actually, yeah, what we expect change the world, of course. That is the whole idea with these standards, of course, also stabilize and change the world. So, I'm thinking, what about our breaks and so, Emma? I'm, um, I don't have yeah, to have we had uh, 30 minutes. So if yeah. it's almost a half, we can take a break if you prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, so you tell me. Yeah. Okay, so it's a good time. All right. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, uh, I suggest that we take a uh, a smaller break, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So let us meet back at ten to two. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Yes. Thank you. So um, the, the definition, of course, is important for our understanding. And that's, of course, key to standardization. That really, we, we need to see the view the world in the same way, call the same things by the same names. And, and uh, that helps us prioritizing. But uh, then, OK, what can we actually do? And what is within the uh, realms of that standardization uh, work? I again, use the same pictures, as I said already in the beginning, don't have to introduce them every time. So looking at this, what can we really do? And as I said, anyone can do at home what, they, what they're good at. They can buy long-lived products or strictly renewable products, for example. That is, that is a good approach to generally say that rather than, having, rather than buying uh, short-lived things, you should think about that they are living the whole time that you need them. And as a designer, one may again, I can say long lasting products and set appropriate business models because that is a key. Because if you send, sell, design things, sell them on the market, and you can no longer take responsibility. Of course, that is a difficulty for you if you're not around the, the product anymore. And we know many, many more. I just want to really put it into an emphasis that there is the circular economy is for everyone. And Material production, they are usually, they're just supplying what people ask for, um, it, it is the regular response to that. But what they really can do, because they know much about material, is that they can help manufacture to, for example, lower material grades. Uh, so if, if they regularly buy a high material grade, they can actually probably use a lower grade, for example, recycled material, if that happens to be lower. Uh, rather than, than the higher grade that you usually buy. And these kinds of uh, information is pretty, pretty uh, valuable for the manufacturers and the whole life cycle to, to, to not have to make a high investment, but rather can make a lower investment before putting it out on the, on the circular life. But also we're closing the loop, because if we know already from the beginning how uh, valuable a resource is when it, is, uh, when it keeps and preserves its uh, its um, qualities, the, the material industry may uh, advance their uh, scope of, uh, of responsibility to, to rather look into the whole recycling uh, domain. And there are many industries are there, many meat material industries, but it's also a way to, for, a, for, for those who are not to start looking at the new business model thinking. And any secondhand market, of course, they can do things, but they, they, they are already in there. And again, as soon as you're doing a good thing, it might be relaxed and then start thinking, I already do a good thing. I don't have to keep improving. But one thing about these secondhand markets is that sometimes they get waste, uh, things that cannot really be sold. And then they, yeah go to waste immediately because there are no good wastes, uh, yeah, secondhand streams of, of, of not uh, sellable products. And that is, of course, important that they, they make a better view of the, the sales for small part and they uh, throw away big part. And that is, hmm, could be my bane better when they are anyway in the business. And also uh, the, the growing, this growing market for secondhand products and much of that has previously been taken care of by, yeah, maybe those who are not so uh, well off into to the work market, or they are they they are not the regular type of product. They're, they're not not well defined uh, secondhand products. So um, one need to establish this as a yeah, as a good workplace, but also maybe as a profession that that is really something that needs to be designed into the circular economy. And of course, all of these ones are the same, regardless of which level you work at. Um, but for the energy recovery world, we have the waste incineration uh, facilities and so, um, they just, precisely like the material production, they can say that they are just selling what they are requested to sell. But they could also have a role in, uh, for example, I just invented a word for this, for this occasion, require digital, digital waste passports in the same sense that we are looking at digital product passports. They should not just uh, accept to incinerate any high value. They should actually try to ring the alarm bell because they are actually somewhere else, uh, somewhere in the, in the value, value chains where, where this uh, could be interesting to, to look into. 
and uh, recycle sorting. Uh, if we just have a, a different uh, fragmentation machine, uh, that is that, that's not really a high goal. It's it's a simple thing. Uh, of course, one can try to sort everything out afterwards, but one could set higher goals, specifically when it comes to remanufacturing and re refurbishing. Uh, and also, they, they should really look to close and narrow all loops in that sense, to really not try to make it all ways the recycling way, but try to, to, to go in, in better ways. And we know when many of the recycling industries are already there, but they're de depending on where you are in that market. And these are individual organizations, but they are at the, at the higher level, it's about value networks. We, uh, um, to put together a symbiotic relationships. Again, this is something ongoing, but it has to be developed more so that byproducts from one producer uh, can be used as a raw material or another value at the next, uh, at the next uh, actor or producer in the network. Um, and for that, they also need to share uh, establish information exchange. So uh, whole networks can also do things in, in, in total uh, com compliance with the, with the approaches to standards on maintaining circular uh, resource flows. And on regional and national level, they are mainly setting regulations and giving incentives and so. And just as example, set incentives for longer uh, lifetime of products. It uh, could be by in, uh, giving incentives for, for um, uh, service, uh, service uh, companies or, or try to uh, yeah, uh, be part of recycling and sorting systems, etc. So these are the things that one can do to immediately take the, re, uh, the, uh, the definition of circular economy and start acting directly on that. And just, yeah, this, just all the same pictures, but stacked on top of each other to show, wow, how much one can really do. Um, and as again, what, what is said in the standard, and as a, this is one of the few occasions that I have taken a snapshot out from a standard. I did not take the whole of the picture because I don't think that that is the correct way to do it. But just to show how, it, how the standards are currently being developed. So they look at different actions, area of actions, eco design, it says here, resource management, the procurement, industrial and territorial symbiosis, solution provisions, reverse logistics. And of course, all of these ones are, are categories of, of um, activities that organizations can do. And more specifically, foster reduction of use of resources, foster the use of renewable resources, foster the use of recovered resources, comes to biomimicry, uh, implement sustainable forest management. Of course, you understand that at this level, it has to be a non-exhaustive list, as it says up here. It's more examples to set the mind on, on uh, the standards reader that it, it's really up to do something here that eventually leads to better circularity. And again, in the standardization, there are terms, areas of action, action that can be undertaken at some defined step of the value chain or, or, or value network. So something that someone can do, that's what I already said. What can everybody do? Yeah, they can do something at some, somewhere in the, in the uh, value, in ch value chain or network. And the sphere of influence, which is, I think, the most uh, positive term, uh, what can I think of in a standard? Because if you do something, if you have, if you take an area of action, you 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 put uh, waste in the right sorting bin, you you actually have a sphere of influence when you did that. The range extent of political, contractual, economic, or other relationship through which an organization has the ability to affect the decisions or activities of individuals or organizations. I would now like to change this definition because I'm into standardization. I would like to say the range of each an, um, uh, an individual or organization has the ability to affect. As I said, if you put the thing in the right bin, you have actually started making a difference already in the, in the circular economy. But these are the, the type of concepts and terms that are being standardized in there to really show how circular economy is about to change the world. It's on a level of detail. What pe people do is a level of detail what, what, uh, on the strategies. And uh, it's really trying to describe this world that circular economy is, uh, how the world of circular economy needs to be 
uh, set up in, in terminology and uh, what we will look at. Oh, there's an area of action. I mean, that is a word to be start using or my sphere of influence, which is a very positive word when you think about people feel um, that they are not uh, having any power, that they're, they're not part of politics. But if you think of your sphere of influence or your organization's sphere of influence, it's pretty, pretty positive thinking. So how do I know the circular performance? What is the circular performance? So if I, I, I have act, yeah, I act, I do some of these things, extend the lifetime of the solution or I implement integrated water management practices. How do I know um, uh, the circular performance of that? And um, if you are someone, how do you know that my effort really makes a difference? And if you're someone selling shoes or something, uh, how to know, uh, how do you know that your co consumer, your 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 your, um, your co uh, customer really trusts you? How to know that the promise circularity claim is right? I mean, this is the the, the chicken and the hen. I, I don't dare to buy and I don't dare to produce. If if you're if you're squeezed into that situation, nothing happens. So um, how should we measure the circularity performance of the system influenced by the specific circularity actions? Um, and um, remembering now that we have here a number of organizations in here, we have a syst economic system and they are interlinked with resource flows and all, all the support systems. And uh, how do we measure here? We start with some, being someone, for example, someone here that, that taking a circularity action, establish what we call currently in the standard a control variable for the circularity action could be if I want to make a product that live longer, so how many light products do I save by that longer lifetime? Because I don't have to sell two, maybe one and a half, or even, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so, so did, did, what did I really say there? Mm, I, don't, I think I said it the wrong way. It sounds like it. Anyway, I'll try again. So if I, if I used to sell, if I used to sell two, I maybe only sell one now. So that means that I save a lot of material for only having to save one. So, so these kinds of uh, estimates you really pinpoint something that mm, I really saved something here. And then based on that, then you can identify a number of indicators throughout your organization that happens at the same time. So you, it indicates that you, you can use to calculate amounts of maybe less resources spent on product um, on the production and even less waste and less logistics per happy consumer out there, which is of course the, the whole idea to, to to, to manage to produce more value with less resources. And that would be, of course, good. And having done that inside your organization, that is when you start looking at your red system boundary, the economic system. What, what is my area of influence when, I, when that happens? So you start following all your resource flows to establish what we say full systems model and, circ uh, and circularity indicators. So uh, to calculate the circularity and circularity indicators typically are, I come to that on the latest slide here, but it's typically are the resources used and the resources circulated, the primary material used and, and res uh, yeah, these kinds of things. You identify a number of these indicators and you try to find them. And um, for, for those who immediately feel I will never have time to do that, it's always good to know that I think we, we hear really we know that there's a lot of background data needed. For example, what is the uh, typical amount of recycled steel in steel? What is the typical amount of, of um, uh, recycled paper in paper, etc.? So that's kind of um, background data sometimes and specific data sometimes, as always. And having done this, you, you know precisely what you do at home. Uh, you, you have an idea on what that happened, what happens in the economic system based on what you did at home, you, uh, how you influence that system. And then you start looking at how do I contribute to sustainable development? So use appropriate methods and models. And I already, already said that some of them were life cycle assessments, some of them are UN sustainable development goals, and some are some of the um, uh, ISO 26000, for example. And, and to, 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 to assess this system that you have now started to understand since you know what you're doing, you know how your you influence is, is impacting that. And eventually, your last step when you have done these things, you go back and assess the total system study to see 
hmm, what did I learn? I, I did some things here at my work, uh, work situation uh, in, in my desktop. I looked at how this changes the entire system and then I'll see also how it affects people in the, yeah, if throughout the value chain, could be in my country, could be elsewhere. And um, uh, what do I think? Should I really do this action or should I, should I fine tune it a bit until it's, it, it's perfected? So this is how to measure the circularity performance as we currently regard it without using the specific uh, models or texts from, from the ongoing standardization. But now I will use a little of it at least to, to be more specific. Um, and the, the work where we do that, the 59020 measuring and assessing circularity, then we provide the method to calculate and assess the circularity. And we have a taxonomy for circularity measurement. And uh, I compressed it quite a bit. I took away a lot of details to because the details will anyway be uh, changed over time. But there are three areas, kind of the same as I showed you before, monitoring circular actions. This is very much what I said is about what you des design your product differently. And that means that you also change uh, the inputs and outputs into your organizations, your organization. And then there's the whole system that you look at and you have the resources, the resource flows in and out, the retain, regenerate and create different type of uh, resource values in there. And at the end is the, uh, assessing the sustainability impact. And that is what I also said there. So this, the, the structure here is, is based on the whole, the, the same idea I showed you, but it's also on the very bottom. I, I had to still close my laptop with the fear of closing the entire session. Um, but, but here um, the, on the bottom, you see there's also intended that there is a systemic approach to this. So you cannot just go out and measure in the office and then uh, go to another world and measure in the, in the system flows and, and eventually go like another sustainable development uh, assessment. But they really need to be interlinked. So the knowledge you find in your product design, you connect that with the entire resource flow throughout the, throughout the society, the value network. and based on what you learn there, you, you, you look at your, your sustainability impacts. So that, that is how we learn more about what each individual do. If I buy a long lived product or if I buy something that is just for, for the week, that they actually have this entire influence, uh, the chain of influence over the value networks. And examples of these uh, indicators, uh, probably good because what, what, what are they? The circularity indicators in, uh, in yeah, for, for, um, for my actions in, in, in the office, so to say, decreased amount of material in product could be what I do, increased share of recycled material, prolonged product lifetime, number of uses per leasing contract could be examples of, of what I want to do as a, as a uh, producer or, or market vendor. Uh, regarding the whole worldview, amount of used primary resources taken directly from nature, amount of used recycle resources, quantification of slowed down resource flow, because if we do that, we don't have to take so much out. And of course it's a double count in a way, but it's also interesting to see how, how different uh, industrial systems or societal system works if we slowing them down or if we just taken out less. Quantification of regenerated biodiversity, quantification of created value. So, uh, so this, typical indicators for, 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 for the large system and for sustainability, improved work conditions for workers, increased economy based on sustainable innovations. That is something we always want. We want people to, to be kept capable of innovating and we want them always to do sustainable innovation just because that improves the world in unexpected ways. Uh, reduced amount of greenhouse gas emissions and reduced amount of biodiversity degradation. So, so many different ways that we can assess the sustainability of something that is circular. Then here is a, an example, just to take it down to what, what has been done. It's, it's um, by us, uh, my, me and my uh, colleague, uh, colleagues at uh, RISE and uh, Lean Shipping University and SKF. I will go through it quite quickly, but just to show that it comes alive when one does it. Um, so we, we, we work together with SKF to look at a, a system that is reconditioning oil. And uh, we try to use this thinking when, uh, in, in the project to see is it really practical and what does it mean? And um, 
So, so we started with verifying whether the system is even circular from, a, from a, the definition point of view. So we started asking, do we see a systemic, uh, that's a systematic, systemic maintenance of a circular flow resources? And then do we see regenerating resource values? And do we see retaining resource values or adding or creating? Do we see contribution to sustainable development? And when we, when we say, could say yes to all of these, we said that, okay, it's prone to circularity. It seems like there is a circularity in this system. And as a next step, we, we look at the system as such, which is this. And you see, we have a global system somewhere out here where we take crude oil in and uh, there are waste and emissions, of course, as in all systems in reality. There's also an economic system in there where, where uh, there are customers of, of uh, what is being produced uh, in, in, the, uh, in this um, yeah, recond oil system. And then there are a number of things going on. It's some metal work, get, contaminating oil, and this is a circular system that makes it, yeah, the oil being recirculated rather than just as it used to be before, before, just put in there and sent out. But now it's actually used here uh, quite a huge number of times, actually. And um, two very important things we learned is that, okay, okay, this is good, of course, we understand that. But it's also interesting that it depends on how long the system works and how, how big the system is, because we also see that we need to have a circularity support system in order to make this, um, to make this uh, circularity go, uh, go on. And uh, there is a trade-off between these two, because this is an investment and this is a functionality. And that is the same with all sorts of recycling system. There is some uh, re recycling or re-system in general. There is something re-going on, something re-establishing, regenerating, refurbishing. And uh, when you did not do that before, you can save entire effort of having it. But now that we you need to do it, you need to think of how to design that one this the support system in order to to make um, to make the whole uh, uh, yeah circularity uh, worth worthwhile. So I think that we can expect quite a lot of of this uh, type of development in in the future. And uh, what we learned, crude oil. Okay, we have a number of, uh, uh, use of crude oil, reduced amount of crude oil. Okay, we did not really uh, reduce much there, but we could see eventually that we, let's see what we have, full replacement of uh, oil system because in the first run, we had um, the full investment for the whole circularity system. And uh, let's see what we eventually have as uh, coming waste and emissions and uh, we had, I think it's on the next page, which is pretty interesting. Just, I will not go through it in full detail, but we see here, for example, that the retainment factor is 5,000 times, which means that basically um, times, um, times 50 when we circulate oil rather than having it as a, as a one-time go as it used to be. And these kinds of uh, gains are, are pretty important and, and they're pretty nice to find that we can measure them and they make sense. And as you can see, the regeneration and the retainment are pretty much in, in uh, the same type of statement that we, we, we regenerate it 50 times, which means that we prolong it 5,000 uh, times, it's kind of a rubber band, so to say. But it it's really makes sense to put these things of uh, type of information in, in, into, the, uh, into a common understanding. And of course, also the sustainable development it was an LCA done in parallel. We did not do that. It was IVL who did that. And um, uh, we, we can see that um, there, yeah, there is a lot of gains. So um, uh, basically, we, uh, the, uh, the, the recon oil system are the small ones. You hardly see them uh, in different uh, formats, integrated and standalone. I, don't, I will not go into the details. But we see that you, you gain a lot of raw materials, a lot of waste, a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, the total, of course. So, so uh, this is the way to combine circular measurement with um, the sustainability measurement to get the full uh, assessment of, of the circularity. Um, hmm? Circular economy is a coordinated action. 
uh, and we, I think we understand that, but sometimes you see that an organization wants to be circular or uh, that you have a circular product or something, someone have a circular design. But having this challenge to, to be in a circular coordinated action, how does anyone know the story behind and what is inside the product they buy here? Uh, it's, it's pretty hard, of course. And, and uh, one can guess, one gets a small note of someone has stated something. And it's the same everywhere. Everybody experiences the same thing uh, all over the, uh, the, the circular economy that we don't really know. We don't know what's in there before and we don't know how to treat the, the product later on. And uh, this is acknowledged, of course. Uh, and um, in, in the standardization is, the, as I said, 5940 product circularity data sheet that is taking care of that. And what is expected to be there is quite an early stage, but what we can expect to find there is to, to get data exchanged through value networks, such as materials and components lists, material specification, component structure, so you can really break it down. Who knows? We don't, we're not sure if that is really to be part of it yet. Depends on, because we don't want to um, re make redundant standards that are already existing and other standards. I will also come back to that. A service and dismantling guidelines. And this should be basically manuals to show how to do that. Otherwise you cannot prolong the lifetime if you don't know how to, to, to uh, take a product apart. Uh, recycling and reuse requirements, who knows? I don't. We have no idea what happens here in, 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 the, in that development with regard to that. And that will of course have also be in, in, in parallel with, with the other standards development. Secondhand sales channels, how to refurbish, one hope that these kinds of information is in there, how to remanufacture and how to close recycling loops. But as I said, this is an early stage and, uh, and it started off as seed document that has been then been questioned and will be worked on quite more after that. And what, what about digitalization? And anyone can expect that this, since it is data sheet, it has to be digitalized. And, and of course, so I just wanted to add that kind of like this, um, a statement that uh, do we really think about what the digitalization can uh, enable and in some way uh, we already have uh, ongoing in europe the product circularity data sheet is probably likely to match this digital product passport in eu eu we don't know if there will be, be precise matches or what happens but there, of course there will be some some uh, relationship there but if you want to go beyond there uh, into, for example, automation and in industrialization in that sense, we need, we need more than, than uh, this kind of data sheet. We, we probably need to go into other standards families. And uh, ah, of course, this is just uh, pictures, but you see up on top here, something I worked with uh, uh, some years ago, it's QR codes put into a uh, metal, um, uh, foundry uh, molds when you make different products, you want to, each of them to have their own fingerprint made by QR code. And we did that and that was kind of a good start to start understanding more about how traceability and its challenges inside any organization, in, in, in any material category, in any type of industry where you put together products, because how to do these ones are really depending on, on production uh, type and, and how it will eventually uh, live. But the good thing is that you can actually put any type of information. You can read it so you can get all the information, but it can also add more information to the digital twin associated with each such uh, QR code. So, um, so uh, having just introduced that, that of course everything digital out there, not only production that is done today should be digitalized, but also of course we understand that we've seen waste management facilities uh, sorting digitalized, but also uh, dismantling. So, so you don't have to probably in, in the future um, uh, fr uh, fr uh, fragment uh, way, uh, yeah vehicles or anything you, you probably are, are able to to more dismantle them and take them apart into into components if that is considered uh, the most um, uh, economic way and it should if you have designed the products right so having said that the reason the, the circular resource flow of course we need qr codes in this care just put them here it could be rfid tags could be fingerprints could dna codes anything but in order to make this work, uh, one needs to have them identifiable all over. And um, 
Now I just put them out here and there because otherwise the picture is really messy. Uh, but but they need to be everywhere and you need to be able to, to trace what's in there. You need to be able to get some guidance on how to, how to do your best as a next step. And um, uh, basically what that, what that implies is that this oh, very, very uh, uh, abstract figure one may say on the bottom here, it's um, uh, the, the small chess, chess um, squared uh, unit, it's some material, it could be a plastic bag, it could be a plastic box, it could be a metal, metal facility, even a, a piece of wood. One have to have some way to identify, it's a unique uh, code, and you have to have some uh, uh, yeah, identifier, so the unique code, but you also have to have a way to write, the, uh, read and write that code, maybe, or in, in the beginning. And it has to be possible to link that to some kind of data representation. Uh, so for example, pieces of wood are very, very, they are basically like fingerprints, so one could just read the different pieces of wood, store the identity of the wood piece uh, in, the, in the database. And then as it goes out through the world, you can follow it and you can see what happens to it. Or it could be like these QR codes here. You have made it in your foundry and you, you um, read it the first time, store data into the, information, into the information system. And again, the service units, recycling units, uh, any, any, anyone out there can both read and write the information associated with this, which of course, well, on the one hand, facilitates circularity, on the other hand, explores, explodes uh, uh, the uh, availabilities to make, uh, to make uh, new, completely new innovations and, and the innovation domains. So this is part of, the, it's a prolongation of the digitalization of circular economy, not only to make it circular as intended, but to really make all individual pieces of, uh, of, um, of uh, material uh, in themselves be interesting carriers of information that can be used in, in completely new ways. So I just now I said, I don't have to say that again. So um, what we did, if, if, two, three years ago now, we, we investigate what exists out there in the standards world on, on how to exchange data or how to exchange ownership between pieces of material and uh, how to label pieces of material, how to read labels and how to structure all types of digital twin data about them. We, we noticed that most of this is already out there and we, we called it at that time standards for internet of materials and basically a review of this existing sector independent standards. And the reason to do it for sector independent standards is because a piece of aluminum passes through mining sector, metal sector, automo automotive, uh, scrapping, next time is a beer can or whatever it is. It's, these kinds of sector independence is, is extremely important to be able to really trace resources throughout the um, throughout circular life cycles so we checked we saw it exist and we we we, we now try to uh, establish some new standard that maps the ones that exist and maybe initiate new standardization for 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 especially for 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 um, um, labeling um, materials because not not all materials are easy to label today sand piles or mining or uh, things like that these are difficult to label today we, we might find new ways ah this is what they might look like these standards in there when we look down here this is of course one box the way to put the box but this is this precise specification of something in machining machining tools etc so what's there? A circular economy between consumer and producer. I mean, there's so many ways here I've described circular economy in different ways, very much what one can do. But the key, of course, what, what, what does a um, consumer and a producer, how, what's the relationship, the circular relationship between those? Could be this, that the customer really want to, to, to have earphones that they don't they, they don't just are expensive and then they need to buy new expensive ones soon and then expensive ones again they would like to have a trust that they can really see that these earphones some way most of it is like uh, is uh, has some kind of a lifetime criteria that they could yeah live up to 
And uh, so the trust is important and that someone, maybe a third part verification, maybe someone somewhere else really, yeah, yeah, true. They, the promise that they have, the producer, it's really up to the standard that we have. And it's possible that when you buy that earphone, uh, they, they actually have done their best. And uh, if they say 12 years, you get 12 years and uh, there's actually an upgrade in between there. So you get good quality during these 12 years. These kinds of information, uh, these kinds of trust that my, my decisions as a customer is always verified by some kind of standard so that the producer can live up to it. And the producer, of course, always have some risk because they start a new business model. They start a new design process in order for you to buy something. And if you like it one time and one, one week, and then you, you, you're no longer happy about it, that's not a good for a producer. So this establishment between trust of both parties is very important. And we think that that is what, what standardization already does. Standardization is needed to establish trust. It's also not only needed, it's also based on it, uh, to establish trust for the many way, new ways that products will be given circular features, such as long and many lives. So this is something that we, we of course, we, we know that there, there are other ways. Long life is one thing, good service is another thing. Uh, yeah, sustainable uh, materials. All these trusts has to be established between producer and customer. So uh, coming to an end uh, here, in summary, the ISO TC323, circular economy, it does develop crucial standards. That's why I have emphasized them uh, quite a lot. Is um, there the also um, some additional standards needed? We, we as a, we're in, in coming into coordinated standards for digitalization. So we, we should share information, but we should also think a bit, a bit longer how to really make a new type of business that is stabilized on circularity and circular economy. And that is digitalization could really be a, a tool there. To reach consumers, we will need to be more specific on product lifetime. Uh, why do I stress that so much? Uh, partly because I work with it quite a lot, uh, but also because that is how I think that, that is one of the, the changes that need to be done. We have learned, um, teach, taught. We have taught um, uh, organizations that they should think about life cycle cost more than than just uh, price. And we now we need to go over to also make, make consumers think about that, that life cycle cost is actually what is worth something. Uh, and, um, and, and when you think life cycle cost, it's, it's, it's really uh, also a sustainable sustainability decision. And uh, oh, I don't know if uh, that the, the last one, I haven't addressed that so much actually, uh, but we, it was the first one I said, when we invest a lot of va value in, um, in, um, uh, uh, in our, uh, from, from extraction of re resources into a final product, we, and then we lose it again. I mean, this kind of control we cannot accept. We really need to see that when, when we have invested values, we really shouldn't spend that money to invest value one more time. We should spend it on schools or whatever, uh, elderly care or yeah, preparation for the next pandemic. You don't know what, but there are better ways to do it than do it all, all over again. So just one done end uh, where I also started there was interest invested value. And we want to have a longer lifetime, of course, then we save a number of different uh, roller coaster loops. We can also refurbish in between, not so bad, much better than losing it all the time. And we can have even longer lifetime, of course. But these kinds of thinking and, and relating that to, to value is really important to get that into their head both national economics and also industry uh, economics of different kinds to understand, okay, we know that you earn the, earn the money on the top there, but there's other ways to build your business models. So um, this is ending. It, this is the same as I had to begin. So I will not read this slide again. You, do, you will be pre pretty bored. I just uh, go over to this final slide. So thank you. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much.